Okay, welcome back to Swans Cast Podcast, everyone. And today, I'm actually very happy to be joined and very privileged to be joined by, well, what can I say, world champion from Swansea. So welcome, Paul. And you might have to correct me on your surname. Karabadak, is that correct? Have I said that right? Or have I made a really bad effort? No, that's really good, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad. So I'm really thrilled that you're joining me today, Paul. So obviously... You're a massive Swans fan yourself, but you've gone to be an athlete in a different field and you play table tennis, uh, or do you call it para table tennis in your field, um, and been very successful as well. So we're going to talk about some of your career, your achievements, which I'm sure everyone will be happy to, to hear about because, again, being a local a local person from, from the area, it's always nice to see people doing well. And then we're also going to talk about your experiences as a Swans fan and your uh, relationship with football. And obviously, we've got the World Cup going on at the moment. So it only makes sense to kind of have a chat about how Wales are doing. Uh, maybe you can perhaps share some of your uh, insights in being successful. And maybe if uh, if anyone was to hear it, it might help them get through the group stages and into the later stages of the competition. But yeah, let's let's get cracking then. So... This is also a learning experience for me, okay, about yourself and your career. Um, I've been having the read through and it seems like you've done so well for yourself and it's really good to read how successful that you have been up until actually this month even where you've uh, recently been involved in a competition to, to become doubles world champion. So we'll get up to that point and speak about it. But I want to take you right back to perhaps the beginning. So I have read that, you know, you used to be, you used to love football as, as a young boy. Um, and unfortunately, you went through some difficult times. And as a result of that, you found yourself um, sort of getting back into sports through table tennis. Now, I know there's more of a story behind that. And I would like to ask yourself maybe to explain it a bit more because I think you will do it a lot more justice. But is that something you can kind of tell us a little bit about your beginning in your career? Yeah, definitely. Um, as a young boy, I loved football, um, played a lot of football. But my local side Garwitton and was down there training every night and always playing really enjoyed it but then unfortunately at the age of 10 I suffered a stroke while out playing with friends and then of course football was no longer an option for me and I was left with with a massive hole of needing to do something because football had played such a big part in my life um my mum found out about a local youth club down Cambulla called Friends of the Young Disabled and so I went along and tried a few things. They had lots of activities, darts, pool, they had the gym, they had table tennis, so I tried table tennis and just really enjoyed it and ended up they wanted to put me in the local team and play in the local league, which at the time was only Division 6 in the Swansea leagues. So I just started playing for them and progressed and got better and moved up the divisions. And then That's brilliant. Ended up, ended up leaving there for Penland and again... I mean, Penland gave me my big break and they, they, Betty Gray, who was in charge at, at the time, who was a very good Welsh player, anyone in table tennis would know her. She said, I need to play in the top division for the top side, which put a lot of people nose out of joint because they, they were better players than me and they, they felt aggrieved that I was put ahead of them. So I'd always be thankful for that because I think playing in the top division of Swansea League in the top team for Penland. I think that really helped me with my career. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Betty. Obviously, I believe, I'm correct in saying, she carried the Olympic torch when we had the home event in Swansea. Um, I think she did a stint with that, or was intended to anyway. Um, but yeah, I've told, I spoke to you before as well. Like my granddad was involved in the Swansea League and, and all that stuff of the table tennis. So I do know a little bit about it, but it's great that obviously you worked yourself up locally, got to that. And I think you're saying some people were aggrieved. You perhaps got rushed forward to the top, but ultimately I think if they look back now, 
you can't argue with that decision. I think somebody somebody definitely saw the the potential there, and you've definitely gone on to achieve um, well very very well afterwards. So it's really really um, obviously a sad kind of start, but then inspiring. I think uh, is the right word to use because you kind of lost something that you really enjoyed but then also found something else and and have kind of threw yourself into it and done so well and i think that's a really inspiring sort of story for a lot of um, you know for for anyone that might be going through some troubles and i think you should be proud of yourself there so we'll move on to perhaps when it starts getting a bit more serious in terms of like competitions and and your success so I did, like I said, I had a little bit of a re read through, um, but I just want to ask one question uh, before we move on to those, the medals and all the glory. I just wanted to ask, like, how important do you think finding this new sport um, was for your recovery and your rehab after after the, the stroke that you had as a young boy? Um, I think it was really important. I think it was almost vital that I found something that I could that I could pursue and that I loved and that I had a passion for. I think um, physically I needed that in terms of re rehabilitation. I think it's helped me massively with like my, my body and being in walk as well as I do and being as fit as I am. I think it's massively important and I think if I wouldn't have done that, I think life would have been very difficult for me physically so i think yeah. it was it was really important that i found that that's it's, that's that's great like again what back to what i said i think like a lot of people can if hopefully can listen to this and take good inspiration going forward and i think you should be proud of that um i did a little bit of reading and obviously i guess you had a lot of inspirations you mentioned betty obviously but one other guy whose name's name has popped up was Neil Rob Robinson, I believe, also another Welsh Welsh person involved in the table tennis scene. Was he a big influence to you before you progressed into your career, and how much did he mean and help going forward in your career? Um, when I started playing at the Premier League, Neil Robinson was representing a team, so I'd see him play and he's in a wheelchair and I saw him play and it against good able bodied players and beat good able bodied players, which was really inspiring and made me think if he could do it, I could do it. And he's had a legendary career and he's won Paralympic medals, world championships medals, Europeans and he's been a top top but he was a top top player for a long time. So I think that gave me a lot of inspiration and belief that I could also achieve the same sort of things that he achieved. Yeah, and and I think you have done so, and hopefully there's there's somebody that perhaps looks up to you in that same way, and and maybe goes on to have such a successful career as well going forward in the next few years. So, um, okay, so I guess he was inspiration. You started being successful. You've um, obviously progressed to the Swansea League, got to the top leagues. You've since then got involved in several Paralympic uh, Games. Um, your first one being in 2008, if I'm correct, after you just missed out on selection in 2004. So yeah. I just wanted to ask, what was it like? Was it disappointing when you missed out in 2004? Or was it kind of like, right, I'm on the right track. I'm going to make sure I get there next time. Like, How did you overcome uh, missing out that selection and making sure you get there the next time? Um, I don't think it... It wasn't that big of a blow to me personally because I I just missed out and I was very young so I don't think it affected me but unfortunately because I didn't qualify I ended up losing all of my funding with, and I think that was the most difficult part and then I wasn't really in the team and then I had to battle my way back from that and try and achieve some good results by self-funding my way to competitions and getting some good results and winning medals and I got my funding back after two years of doing that so I don't think qualifying didn't really affect me that not qualifying didn't really affect me that much personally it was more in terms of the funding that affected me 
how how difficult in that position is it to, to sort of get that funding and you know get the right people on board to sort of provide that for you um it is difficult because you if you don't have the funding you get cast down and it's quite lonely and it's quite difficult to find the motivation to carry on training and yeah. carry on and be positive and try and get yourself back on track. Yeah, I can imagine that is quite hard. I think that's the sort of side of um, some of these sports that feature in the Olympics, especially that maybe a lot of people don't quite see. You see the, the bits on the telly when you're in the events and, having the success but it's all the hard work getting to those stages i think a lot of people maybe don't know what goes into it and how much you rely on on certain things and what can push you back but again to get through that and then you made it to the 2008 team and that was your first experience of a paralympic games um so what was it like to get that call up then and to be part of that um i was over the moon when i qualified for for Beijing, I thought I'd qualify, but then to finally qualify was just a big relief because I'd, I'd always be a Paralympian then. No, nope, yeah. that sort of thing away from you. And um, to, for it to be in China, for it to be in the home of table tennis, where table tennis is huge, I mean, top players are like fo- the equivalent of footballers and they're just superstars the games with so much respect yeah and, I, and the arena was like the best i've ever played in and everything was put into table tennis it was like the the showcase in beijing so i think that made it really special as well what was um what was your favorite moment from being out in china then and was it like your first one of your first major tournaments i guess that you were part of as well or or the biggest uh, category at that time? Yeah, I think it was the biggest one I'd competed in, and I think it was just just special. The Olympic Village was nice, and um, the crowds that turned out, I think that's what made it special, as well as the venue, the venue being the best I've ever played in. It was just rammed with maybe 6,000 people every day. And yeah. it was just... And, um... What was your in 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 the Beijing tournament? I obviously was your first experience, so maybe your expectations of how far you got were lower compared to maybe your fourth one. But what was that like then? How far did you get? And um, do you think you perhaps overachieved or underachieved? I think um, it was difficult in Beijing because there was four in a group and only one qualifies out of the group which is a bit harsh i think but yeah. i had the one in my group who was from from china <laughs> so it was really difficult but i had a good with him and i played really well but unfortunately i lost quite closely i was happy with my performance and then i i ended up beating this the one of the players and then I lost to another good player from Spain who was probably top six in the world at the time so it was a difficult group but I thought I I played well and performed really well and even though I didn't progress the group I was really happy with the way I played and performed that's that's the main thing and it's the experience as well but I mean if you're playing against the home could be the home favourite then if it's the world champion, I'd imagine. Um, you could say you, you pulled the group of death a little bit there, but to put a good account for yourself, um, yeah, definitely something to be happy with. Um, moving on to the next Paralympic Games. So you're saying that you were perhaps lucky or fortunate enough to be involved in one in the home of table tennis, but you also then were involved in one in the UK, which, you know, they don't come around that often. So to have that as well, was that another special experience for you? Yeah, London was really special to play to play in Great Britain and to have the home fans on your side and it was just a, just a really special experience. But again, it was really difficult because only one qualifies of the group and um, I had another top player in my group and then ended up winning my other game. 
but then just one goes through. So I, I then progressed the group again, which was hard. Was it more more disappointing in the London one because if it was the home, kind of the home tournament then? Or yeah, I think it was really disappointing for me, London. Um, I wanted to maybe progress a bit further and try and battle for for a medal, and then I think it, yeah. it's tougher than the more that you the more setbacks you have and the more disappointment you have. I think. It, it gets a little bit hard. Um, yeah. And I think bouncing back, which I guess we did later on, is always makes it feel so much better. But I'm curious then, because obviously one person qualifying from these groups, um, is is that the system still now? Because that seems like a bit of a tough system. Um, no, they've, they've changed it, thankfully. Um, just before... The 2016 Rio Paralympics, they changed it to two qualifying, which is a lot better because you you always get like a top five, top six player in your group and then it's difficult to get out of the group. So I think it's there's more to play for than when two can qualify. Yeah, I guess it opens up the field and if, if, if you're one of the four players and perhaps you're the lowest rank, I guess maybe you feel like all of a sudden if i play out of my skin a little bit here then i might have a chance of going through whereas if you get drawn in the group and you're kind of the outsider against the world number one you might go into it thinking well it's good that i got here and it kind of changes that mentality a little bit for some players i'd imagine um so have, having that extra slot available maybe causes some upsets as well yeah i think i think i think it makes players more relaxed and if they've got a chance and there isn't so much on that match, it's not so important to beat the top player. I think you've got more of a chance to win. Yeah. And and I guess when you get to the knockout stages, then anything can happen really after that because it just yeah. takes one time for the top player to have an off day and, and, and you to play your best ever game and all of a sudden you've knocked them out. Yeah, definitely. The, the knockout's lottery really. And it's, it's yeah. anyone the top players playing in the knockouts it's anyone's really so you've got probably got a better chance and you've had a few matches and you found your rhythm found your form so i think it if you can get to the group you always have a chance yeah that's, that's i'd imagine that i mean most i think most um sports tend to use the four group to go through kind of system so um maybe that works best and hopefully we'll stay the same going forward for 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 table tennis as well um one more thing on the london uh, paralympics then i just just curious you went to china and you went to london how do those two compare like how different was the experience um one of them being your home home country the other one being so different really like did it feel a lot different did it feel comp even though it's the same tournament being a paralympics did it feel like something completely different um, yeah, I think it felt different because um, I think there was a lot more pressure from, from the fans. Felt felt a lot more pressure with everyone cheering for you when when you were playing and everyone on your side. I think. Yeah, I'd imagine yeah. just having the Great Britain logo next to your name while you're in Great Britain just adds to that pressure so much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know how I would deal with it if I was ever, ever in that situation, but I'm sure I'm sure you put up a really good account for yourself. Um, okay, skipping ahead then, you've been to two other Paralympic Games. So, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you did man manage to get a couple of medals um, in your Paralympic career so far. Um, I've got it, I have got it down here. Four in total, yeah? So... What is the highlight out of all of those medals? Which one are you kind of most happy with? And can you kind of talk about how you managed to, to get to the, the medal and what it felt like doing so? Um, both of my medals really special ways because um, in Tokyo, we played the singles first and then I then took that medal to win that bronze medal I'd wasted 20 years for it so that that was really really special 
and I'd beaten the world number four and the world number five to achieve that medal. So it was really good. But then the silver, yeah. silver I had in the team event was I had to beat the world number one to for me and my team partner to progress from the semi into the final and it was played live on channel five so that was also really special um they're both special in different ways and i think yeah I'd, I'd imagine yeah like everyone is going to be important to you i'm um, sorry i just want to correct myself i read that wrong when i introduced but it was four paralympics you've been part of and then two medals and they both came in tokyo um, yeah. So congratulations on both of those. And like you said earlier, you can never take being a Paralympian away from you. And what you definitely can't take away is the two medals that I'm sure are in your collection and you're full of pride. And yeah, I, that's a great achievement. And I think to quote something that I, I was going to quote later on, you don't get many of them from Swansea. I think when you refer to yourself as a world champion, that's another thing uh, you could say there for being a double Paralympic uh, medalist. So congratulations. Um, okay, so maybe if we go, actually, there's one thing I wanted to clarify before we go to your recent achievements. And in Paralympic table tennis or para table tennis, you've got different categories based on um, the difficulties you have in the sport. Um, and I believe you have participated in class six and seven. Is that yeah. correct? So yeah. can you just maybe um, explain a little bit about the system, the, the class system, how that works and what that means, and then about the classes that you've participated in, and maybe why have you been between two different classes? Um, basically, the classifications is 1 to 11 class, and then class 1 to 5 is wheelchair only depending on how severely disabled you are. Class one being the most severe, they're, they're, they're like bad hands and they don't really have any trunk movement to where it's class five is the more able and the class fives can walk really. It's just, just maybe a bad leg or something, but they have to sit in the wheelchair. So it's like a, able-bodied player sitting down really and then class six to ten is the standing i'm a class six which is the most severely disabled which will be four bad limbs and like really whereas the class tens are maybe just maybe just an amputee of the um below the elbow so maybe they're missing an arm like below the elbow so they're they're like really really physical. and then class 11 is uh learning difficulties well yeah that's i mean i didn't realize until i started looking ahead to this podcast that there were so many different categories but it does make sense because you know, there's a lot of different things that can, I guess, impact your um, your impact on playing table tennis, for example. So I guess it kind of makes it a little bit more fairer when you're competing against other people in your, your same category then. I guess that's the idea behind the whole thing. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think it's really important, the classification system, and to get people who playing against each other and it being a physically a fairer match. Like you can't really have someone severely disabled playing against someone who's maybe could just got a minimal disability because they'll have no chance then. Yeah, no, that's that's brilliant. And <clears throat> I think it's it's really good to highlight how well thought, thought through all of this stuff is. Um and it, it gives you all a fair chance of winning, doesn't it, and being successful. So yeah, that's it's yeah. really good. Um information um okay so I, I i spoke earlier on that you recently have been part of a tournament so rather than me kind of go off and give a little bit of insight in it would you like to tell us how your month has been in terms of competing um it's been been quite 
successful really. Um, it's been a lot of hard work and a lot of training and uh, quite a bit of travelling. But I've competed at my world championships in Spain and I managed to become world champion in the doubles, which, which was amazing. Which was really good for me. Yeah, do you think that's the best achievement that you've had? Is that your, would you rate that as your top achievement? Um, I think, I think it's probably my best achievement so far, yeah. I think but, it's something you should be really proud of, yeah. Sorry, carry on. Um, but that was doubles and I think, I think as any, as any, um, top sportsman in a in a field where they can compete in singles and doubles you'll always want to do it in the singles yeah and singles world championships was difficult draw was a bit did with the singles cuz i had to play the world number 1 in the first round and just, just and didn't really get going so i was really disappointed with that when the doubles was better than yeah so i think though you can tick off the doubles off your list that's done now i mean not that you want not going to want to do it again i'm sure i'm sure your goal is to get get it again but you've done that one so the next step is the next world championship you know exactly where you need to aim for and to get that single one and then double world champion Singles and doubles can be undisputed. Then, in uh, especially in Wales and in Swansea, very, very good achievement. So, um, I'm, but I'm sure you will continue to work towards that. But you said it's very hard training, done a lot of traveling. I think you said it was in Spain. The um, the World Championship was focused in Spain. Just one or two things were dropping in and out. But um, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about the training and what what that entails and how hard that is for you? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I I train about four or five days a week. A lot of my training is based in Cardiff, so it's a lot of driving. I I go to Sheffield once one week every month, but th this is just for table tennis. I also do a lot of physical training in the gym, which I probably do about four hours, five hours physical training in the gym and then I train about 10, 12 hours just table tennis in the week. But it's a, it's a lot of travelling because I need to go to Cardiff because there's not much in Swansea in terms of training or I need to travel to Sheffield so so it's a lot of driving for me and it, it gets difficult because I'm on the road most days driving two hours most days and then we have camps like I've had I've had a training camp in Slovenia pre-worlds and that was difficult where I train more there it's um four hours training a day table tennis so, so that's really physically difficult for me, but it's something I need to do if I want to keep up with the rest of the world. And I imagine it's worth it when you do bring home the medals and, and that's kind of like the end goal. And when you, when you get that, you know, it makes it all worth it for you, I'd imagine, as well. Yeah, when you achieve, when you achieve the success and then you've got something to show for it, it yeah. um, makes up for it. But the thing is, you don't always get that success. And it, it's difficult and you've got to find the motivation when you don't get that success and you've got to fight and you've got to try and keep on going and it's it's not all about the medals and the winning it's about battling through the hard times and always fighting and always trying to give your best yeah well that's yeah it's a very important message again but i think you've highlighted something there which is like you know people maybe don't realize what can go into being a top level table tennis athlete people see all football the rugby you know is hard work but it can be just as much hard work in these other sports physically as well 
you've still got to stay fit and you've still got to put the hours in and the hard work and I think you've just highlighted how tough it is really and uh, fair play to yourself to keep going I do play a bit of table tennis myself sometimes not knowing near the same level kind of just on my lunch break in work and to be honest I usually lose so I'm not the best but I like to think I'm good but then all of a sudden it never hits the table <laughs> maybe you can give me some tips sometime yeah. um yeah, I'll come. I'll come to one of your training camps in the Slovenia. I'll come back to work, and then all of a sudden I'll be a different player, and it will be like, "What's going on here?" <laughs> um, okay, well, I just want to open the floor a little bit to yourself on any other parts of your career that maybe you want to discuss before we move forward on to maybe talking about some of the football related stuff. Um, I think just just maybe want to talk about just before the Beijing Paralympics, I got yeah. in, I stretched a ligament in my wrist, and which then caused arthritis. So it's been difficult with the training and everything with a wrist that has arthritis and it gets really sore and really stiff. Yeah. But I've managed to stay on top of it with cortisone injections over the last well now 14 years but unfortunately I can't keep having these injections in such a small joint and there's a lot of scar tissue so I've I've decided to to bite the bullet now and have the nerves burnt away so I, I don't no longer feel the pain of the arthritis which I think will be a lot better for me going forward not to be in that sort of pain so I can hopefully get some consistency with my rest and consistency with training and not have, keep on having to have months at a time off. So I think that will be really important for me going forward into France and hopefully the future. Is the next uh, event in France, is it for the, the World Championship? Uh, yeah, next Paralympics. Will oh, next Paralympics, sorry. 2024 will be France, Paris. So okay. that, that's exciting. That's exciting. That's the goal. I'm going to France next year for the Rugby World Cup, but um, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit different. But that's um, I didn't realize something an injury such as that could cause like arthritis. Like I, I know we spoke briefly again before we started here. That you've recently gone through that um, the burning away of the nerves, which. Um, I guess is a difficult decision to make as well to to, to sort of make that jump um but hopefully it does get better for you can have the consistent training and go forward but yeah i didn't realize i'd imagine arthritis is probably one of the worst things you can have in a sport like table tennis where wrist movements are so important um so to play through that pain must have been quite difficult then for quite some time yeah i think it has been difficult but I've tried to keep on top of it with injections and physio and always trying to take care of it. And um, I think it's, I think it's um, maybe the right move now to, yeah. to uh, the procedure of the burning of the nerves. Uh, uh, well, this... yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, I think it, I think it's, um, a good good move and, and hopefully it can improve me as a player going forward now. Yeah, well good luck with the recovery and I hope I hope it is quite straightforward for you and you can get back out there and yeah, improving and, 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 and reaching your next target. So um with a career in table tennis then, last last thing before we move on to the football, um I'm not. I, I I'm not that clued up in like some of the successful athletes across the sport. So, what sort of is the lifespan of a career in in table tennis? Like, where do you normally see players? I know you start quite young, but how far do you think you can go? Um, I think I think if you want to be good, you maybe need to take up the sport like really young, maybe eight, ten years old, some start even younger, like the Chinese, you see like four year olds. Yeah. Right? But I think I think you can go on as long as you want to go on. Um like me, I still enjoy training, I still have a passion for the sport. And I think um I think you can play 
it's depending on each class. Obviously, the some of the wheelchairs can play a lot longer, but I think in the standing class, maybe mid forties, you could play until maybe longer. It's um, there's not really a time on it, but I think as long as I'm still achieving good results and I'm still enjoying it, I think I'll carry on playing as long as I can. Yeah. And put in the hard work and I'm sure it will keep paying off for you. And my fingers are crossed for you that you complete the collection with a singles world title. I'm sure you'll be able to get it now, especially with your um, newly improved wrist as well. So it's going to come. I'm sure it's going to come. Um, okay, so let's, let's go back to the football then. So I mentioned right at the beginning, as a young boy, you were a keen footballer. So you used to love playing football. So... Did you have aspirations yourself about going into, like, if you're going to be an athlete, do you think it was going to be football back then? Is that what you wanted to do? Um, yeah, I think I think I probably would have carried on playing and tried to play again, tried, tried to have pushed to um, play at a le- a, quite a good level, I think. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. And obviously... <clears throat> you know, you ended up with with having to go to table tennis, but as as I think we've it's come across really in this 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 chat that you know you have still got a passion for table tennis and and I guess maybe the passion you would have had for football you definitely show in in your results as well for table tennis. Um, so obviously you're from you've spoken about being from Swansea, you loved football. So I guess I could put two and two together, but I do want to ask anyway. How did you kind of like? become a Swans fan, I was just to love Swansea and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, at school, my friends used to be big Swansea fans, so I went down a few times with them and enjoyed it, but it was, it was difficult back then because, of course, it was at the Vetch, and um, I had to stand on the terraces, so it was difficult to stand so long. Yeah. So I went maybe a few times and then w- when they moved to the Liberty and I had a bit more money than I could go and then I was sitting so I really enjoyed it more and um, just yeah. fell a bit from there really. And obviously good players and stuff makes it even better. Yeah. So when, what sort of like, season or what league were the Swans in perhaps when you started watching them just for a reference point um going down with friends was probably when i was in school was probably division three and then when i started going properly to almost every game buying tickets every week um i think they were in league two under bobby martinez roberto martinez obviously um, currently out in the World Cup with Belgium, uh, made it difficult for themselves actually. I think yesterday when I was watching the game, just about sn- snuck through in in their opening match. But yeah, Roberto Martin is obviously a really good part of the Swans. You probably caught them then, just at the beginning of, I would say, the most successful period then in our recent history. So you know the beginning of the journey of going to the Premier League. So I guess. If that's when you're starting to watch the the Swans, it's kind of similar to me. I had, I think, I started when they were in League One. My story is a little bit different, though. I I used to deliver the Evening Post, I think, when I was like 13, and they were on the back pages all the time. So I just started reading and taking an interest from there, and that's how I got into to watching the Swans. But it was Roberto Martinez in that era as well, so the same sort of time time span. Um, Okay, so going through the leagues then, I was going to talk about this season, but we'll flip it. We'll we'll do the, the journey first, and then we'll talk about this season. Going through the leagues, do you have like a favourite moment or favourite time of watching the Swans, like where you really enjoyed it? What was your favourite thing that you've seen? Um, I think there's been so many enjoyable moments. Like I enjoyed it under Roberto Martinez because he had some great players and obviously Ash Ash Williams coming through who's probably my most favourite player. You had players like Prattley and Border and um, Akin Fenwar and Scotland. Yeah. And I think that was a really good time because that, that team was superb in League One. And then um, 
I think a good time as well was Brendan Rogers and yeah. See that season we got promoted to the Premier League, and then he had a good season in the Premier League. That was superb. And then my Scott Sinclair was another great player for us. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So you said Ashley Williams. I was going to ask who your favourite player was. You said Ashley Williams. Is there any others that um, you really enjoyed watching? And 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 the same for Ashley Williams. Why why were they your favourite players? Um, I think Ashley Williams was my favourite player because he was such a great leader and he was, I think he was a, a massive part to the success we had and the way he organised the team and I don't think anyone could like shirk their shift really because I think Ashley Williams would get on, on their back and I don't think you'd want him on your back. No, really. no definitely not. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think there was a video the other day about um, some altercation in a kid's football match. So, yeah, don't want him on your back. Um, he's obviously out in the World Cup as well, commentating, I think, with the BBC, isn't he? So, um, nice to see him back on the screens, perhaps. But um, any anyone else then? Perhaps who's your best goal scorer? Who, who scored some of your favourite goals? Um, I think I think Fairy Bart, uh, I think he scored some wonderful goals. And I, yeah. For that there. Uh, League One, I mean, really, you could argue he's Premier League standard, and I think he was a superb player to watch. Um, there's so many good ones. Um, I think Danny Graham was decent. Um, Sigurdsson, of course. Yeah. Um, Jose Meech used the goal to one. He was superb. Yeah. There's, there's a long list, isn't there, of, uh, of really good memories when you just say a player's name and you just think of all the, the highlights. You've mentioned Bodder. He's a player for me who I just wish we had the opportunity to see him as we progressed. I'm sure he would have stayed in and around the first team all the way through that journey to the Premier League. And it's so such a shame, I guess, within his injury, I guess. Maybe he's quite relatable in a way of how, how that's changed him to yourself. Yeah, I think... I think yeah, it's a shame that I think he would have had at least two, two maybe three good seasons for us in the Premier League. Like, yeah, like, I think I think he, and I think he would have been an important player for us in the Premier League. But yeah, um, I agree. Fortunately, he got injured, and we'll never know now. No, one of them where I guess we can just. Imagine the best, and I'm sure he would have been great for us. Um, but regardless, we saw good times. One fantastic goal in particular, where I think he scored from the halfway line. Um, I might be wrong, but I believe against Preston. But um, yeah, very, very good, very good. Um, okay, so we talked about some of the history um, of your time supporting the Swans. Let's let's go back to today. Currently, I haven't got it up in front of me, but I think we're eighth in the league going into the break for the World Cup. Um, how has this season gone, in your opinion? And what do you think? Where do you think we are at the moment? How do you see the team performing right now? Um, I've enjoyed this season, but ultimately, really frustrating. Yeah, I think by defending has cost us, and I don't know why we defend so poorly because we got some great defenders. I just don't know what's wrong, and I think if we can address, um, if we can address us. Defensively, I think we got a real good crack at getting into the playoffs and maybe even putting a bit for, for promotion. Yeah, but there's no reason why we can't. I mean, we're, we are eighth, I've just checked. So we're, we're, we're there or thereabouts when it comes to the playoffs. We're really in with a good shout. Millwall in sixth they have got the same points as us, 31 points. So we're in the mix, pretty. We're in the mix. And we haven't actually won in the last five games. So you are right in what you're saying, defending, I think, I don't, I don't know what it is. We just keep making life hard for ourselves. Um, stupid mistakes. A lot of our goal, goals conceded are off our own doing or, or we're giving the ball away in a position where we can't recover. Um, and that is something I hope after this break we can sniff out and get rid of. But it concerns me a little bit that these were the sort of problems that happened all year last year. We got told maybe 
after the summer, everything would be okay. But it's the same problems, even if we have improved in other areas, the same defensive problems seem to be there. So I hope that Russell Martin can turn it around and give us give us a playoff push. But I'm the same as you. I've enjoyed this season, but it's, it is frustrating because it was down then up, but now it's kind of gone back down a little bit. And I hope that it can go go up and we can have a good end. But what are your opinions on Russell Martin since he's taken charge? He's been a little bit controversial with some fans. Others love him. Some would like to see the back of him. Considering we're eighth in the league, you know, it's 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 hard to kind of see the general view of what people feel about him. So what's your opinions? Um I'm a big Russell Martin fan. I've I've met him a few times. I really like him and I want him to be successful. I think his his football's good. I think he's the right man for Swansea City. I just just a bit worried that it's a results based business and if he, he keeps making these stupid mistakes all the time because ultimately it is down to the manager if he's not addressing these things yeah. I think maybe it's we should look for someone else but no I'm a big fan of us and I'm, I'm I really enjoy it I really enjoyed Swans and him and I think I hope and I think he's the man that could take us forward yeah, I agree. I think there was concern after the early start of the season, but I think you know we we obviously talk about it weekly on the podcast, and we called out a couple of things in a constructive way about um, maybe sometimes he's a bit stubborn when it comes to changing certain things. But he he went and changed certain things. He he, he put Ollie Cooper in the team. I think it made a massive difference. He put Bender in the team. Another big difference, and our results did improve afterwards. We shot up the table. And yeah, we've had a couple of games now. We've been off the boil a little bit, but it happens in the championship. We are still in the mix, so I think he deserves time. You know, three wins in three against Cardiff as well. I think that needs to be not understated how important that is. I think, you know, unheard of really in the South Wales derby, that sort of form in one one managerial run. Um, let's just see how the second half of the season goes. I think the tools are there. We just need to cut out them silly mistakes, as you said. But I can't see why the club would need need to rush to pull a sort of trigger because, that, like I said, we, we're on the same points as sixth place. And what's the goal? The goal is playoffs. So I don't know what you feel about um, all of that sort of stuff. Maybe the, the run against Cardiff would be a good thing to discuss. Yeah, I think um, it's been superb against Cardiff, I think. The... the been brave they've been up and I think, I think uh, Russ has got the tactic spot on in all three derby games and I think it's been superb and like you said that can't be understated what he's achieved in the derbies I think I think it's superb and I think I think Russ has been good for the Swans and I hope I hope lot it continues and I hope he can address the um the, the defensive issues we have and we can push on. Yeah, and I'm sure he will. I think I think this is the sort of example where patience will pay off. And I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but one good example to compare to, I think, is Michael Arteta or Mikel Arteta's journey at Arsenal, which this season has resulted in a really good run of form for them where they're actually competing for the Premier League title. I'm not saying we're going to get to that level or anything like that, but I just mean the journey and an example of where being patient with your manager, embedding his style of play with the players, bringing through youth, when it all comes together after a little bit of time, it can really pay off. And I hope that's the direction that we are going in. Now, there's been a few, I think, good players this season really stood stood out for me. But I'd like to ask this season... Who is your kind of like player of the season so far? Who's really impressed you? Um, I think Ollie Cooper. I think he's been superb, and I think credit to Russ for giving him the chance and believing in him. And I think, I just think Ollie Cooper's taken his opportunity so well, and I think he's improving steadily, game by game. And I think Ollie Cooper's been a standout, really. Of course, you have yeah. your play like P role, but. We know what we're going to get with them. And I've also thought Harry Darling's been good as well. And I think, um, yeah, so 
Pivo, Darling, and Cooper. I think they've been our be- consistently our best players. Yeah, Cooper for me is definitely up there. Um, speaking of which, I think it would be a, this is a good transition into the World Cup. We were very frustrated here that Ollie Cooper did not get a call up to the Welsh squad. So I don't know what your thoughts on that, but do you think Ollie Cooper should be in the team right now for Wales? Yeah, definitely. I think um, the game against USA was was sort of crying out for Ollie Cooper. I think I think he could have done maybe done something when the balls were in the box, and I think he could have had a little bit of difference. So I definitely think he should be in this the match day squads, and I think he's 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 shown over this season his form's much better than than um, Mark yeah. Harris and um, the other Cardiff player. So I think Colwell, I think Ruben Colwell. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, yeah I think it, he has a right, and I think to feel aggrieved and not be picked, and I I can't see how that decision has been made because he's been superb this season and I think he could could really aid, aid Wales off the bench. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I uh, got into a little bit of a, not argument, but you know, a discussion with someone in the comments the other day when we were saying, I don't understand the decision of not taking someone like Ollie Cooper, but taking Johnny Williams, for example, or Ruben Colwell, as you just mentioned. Not to knock anything Johnny Williams has done in the past, because he's been really good for Wales. But I think he's at the tail end of his career. You know, he's playing in League Two now, and you've got a fresh new talent emerging in the Championship two two leagues higher. And it's not like he's just emerged either. He's come into the team and he's literally stayed there and been essential to the way the Swansea have been playing this season. So I just don't understand that decision personally. Just If you're going to have Johnny Williams on the bench... I'm not just trying to focus on him either. It's just the one example. But if you're going to have him on the bench, why can't you have someone like Ollie Cooper there who is fresh, exciting and young to come and you, you could change the game because he's that new, fresh, raw talent? Yeah, I, I don't understand either. I don't I don't think you can take players because they, sh- they, they should be going to a World Cup like Johnny Williams is their last chance. I think you should always be looking to the future and... yeah. Not just the future, but Ollie Cooper can do it now, and I think I think with that exposure to the World Cup, it could really really improve him as a player, and I think uh, it it could um, make him better for the future. So I, I don't get it, and I don't get why why the older players have have um, been picked above above Ollie Cooper, maybe out of loyalty or yeah. But, yeah, I think there's a bit of loyalty going on. But, I mean, yeah, it's difficult. I guess when Wales haven't been there for so long, kind of get, you can get why he's done it, but I don't agree with it. I think form form and looking forward should always be what you do with these sort of things. Um, however, you know, he has gone in the end as a reserve role. I can't see it being the case that he gets, I don't think he can get called up now, now the tournament started. But he's out there for the experience, which hopefully sees him good for future opportunities. But Joe Allen, another Swansea player who has gone to the World Cup, obviously returned to the Swans this year. How impressed have you been with him around Swansea? And I believe he's expected to feature in some capacity against Iran tomorrow. I think he's I think he's been superb in the games he's played for Swansea. I think he was really good and looked lively and he'd be unlucky with the injury and I I think Swansea have missed him. I think Wales missed him against United States. And I think if he's playing tomorrow, it'll be a massive boost because I think it's really important to, to Wales. And I think yeah. it will improve Wales a lot. And how important do you think getting him some minutes against Iran tomorrow will be ahead of the game against England on Tuesday? I think it could be vital. And I think, um, I think we'll... We need him in that midfield, especially against such a good team like England. We, we really need Joe Allen in such a huge match, and I think it will be important that he can get uh, get some good minutes under his belt tomorrow. Yeah, I hope he does get on the pitch, and I hope it's you know, 
a nice successful easing back in from an injury and nothing goes wrong there. It'd be great to have him. And it'd be great for him to get some World Cup minutes, you know, because the same as Bale and Ramsey and maybe some of the older players that I would argue are still some of our best players. It's just they might not be there next time we have a tournament or if we get there again. So it'll be nice to see him get some World Cup minutes. Um, okay. What do you think ahead of the England game then? Obviously, I know we got Iran tomorrow, which I don't want to jump ahead too much, but at the same time, it's Wales, England. It's the one everyone wants to watch and is talking about. Can we actually get something out of that game? Um, yeah, I think we can. I think, I think maybe we need to make it difficult for England, and I think maybe we need to frustrate England and, and maybe sit back a little bit. But England was superb in their Iran game. But I think. I think if we can make it difficult and sort of wrestle a few feathers, we're going to have a chance, especially with quality like Bay Ramsey. We're always going to have a chance. It's difficult, but I'm hoping we could get something from that game, and I think we have a chance too. Obviously, the result against Iran tomorrow might dictate how we need to approach the game, depending on what points situation is in the group so it could be different tactics depending on how we fare tomorrow but yes it will definitely be a difficult game i think we've been written off by all quarters of the media and the pundits i've seen comment from sven ericsson um saying like england's bench would would is good enough to or england's second team of reserves is good enough to beat wales so i just hope these sort of comments are put up on the uh the wall in the dressing room as a bit of motivation um as a sports person yourself when you hear stuff like that does that help your performance or does it knock you back um i think i think it should serve as it does with me to make you more determined i think um i think if they play with spirit and they play together they'll have a good chance and it won't be easy for england england are the favorites but i think I think if if Wales do what they need to do, they can make it uncomfortable, and it's not. Yeah, it's not going to be as easy as a lot of people say. Yeah, well, let's hope that is the case, and fingers crossed for a good result for Wales in that game. And maybe based on what you expect of that game, I was going to ask: Do you think we will get out of the group? And if so, how far do you think Wales can can take their journey in Qatar? Um. I think we can get out of the group. Um, I think, I think we we'll, we can beat Iran, and then I think I think we can get something against England. So I think we can get out of the group, and then I think it's it's a lottery on the draw. But I think in the knockouts it's fifty fifty game, and I think I think it's possible that we could see an, another. Another you like we done at the Euros, and I think, yeah, I think um, I think we can maybe go a few rounds and a knockout then. That'd be good. Euro twenty sixteen, um, it's probably one of the highlights of Welsh football, if not the highlight of Welsh football recent history. That uh, semi finals against Portugal, I believe, was the ultimate ending. Um, but then they went on to win it, didn't they? So you can't be too disappointed when you lose to the eventual winners. Uh, but yes, so and finally then, it's the first Welsh participation in the World Cup for 60 years, over 60 years. So the first in both our lifetime. How amazing is it to see Wales represented finally in one of these? Well, what is perhaps the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, sport in tournament in the world? Um, I think it's, it's amazing. I mean, to see the anthems and and Wales on um, against USA, I think it was one of those pinch me moments. I mean, I never thought I'd see Wales at a World Cup, and I'm sure a lot of people did, and the older fans. And I think um, it's just really special and amazing, and I'm really pleased that they they're there, and I'm just enjoying having Wales at a World Cup, really. Yeah. Um, the same. I, I I didn't think they'd ever get there. I mean, recently when they've qualified for the Euros a couple of times, it's been a little bit more kind of like on the cards, but still can't take anything away from the achievement of us getting to this tournament finally. Um, 
there's been a lot of near misses and it just felt like one of them things that it just isn't going to happen but finally it has and I'm so happy that Gareth Bale for example is perhaps the one that's led us there in a way because you could compare to Ryan Giggs if you like but I always felt Gareth Bale he puts everything into his country when he plays for Wales you know he's had some tough times with his club football recently but everything is always most important when he's playing for Wales and and I just appreciate that obviously as a Welsh person myself yeah I think um the way Bale plays for Wales and what he gives to Wales, I think it was really important for him to lead us to the World Cup. And I think, I think it's a really good good group of players. And if it, if it was gonna if there was a time it was gonna happen, it had to be now. And I yeah, I think like with Ramsey and Bale and Allen and these older players, I think I think it's special that they've made it to a World Cup now. Yeah. I think it's definitely something that completes Bale's CV, and um, and he's got a goal as well. To be fair, so I guess you know, I I would say he's probably the best Welsh player in the in history. He's got to be. Um, yeah. Maybe it's recent bias that talk in there, but I think he's got to be. He's got to be up there at least. Um, what, and for Wales, I think yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so probably near the end here, I'll. I'll Again, I'll open up to anything that you want to discuss in a second. Um, but first of all, I, when I was doing a bit of research, I did come across a couple of random facts that are out there about yourself. So I just wanted to kind of touch on a couple of them. One of them being the sporting event that you'd most like a ticket for, Swansea versus Cardiff. Now, did you manage to actually go to any of these games under the Russell Martin period? Yeah, I've got I've got a season ticket, so I've been to all the, the home games and... Just really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, yeah, superb. Swans were so good. I think they were more or less perfect in those games. So I don't think you could ask for more. And and that's definitely still your favourite event. That if you could get a ticket for any game, say I, I said to you, you're only ever allowed to go to one more game ever. Would it still be that choice? Yeah, still be Cardiff. If if not a Wales World Cup final, it would be. Cardiff Swansea Derby. Good choice, good choice. And uh, hopefully that's a Swansea win again. <laughs> um, okay, another one I, I noticed was the three famous people you would most like to have a drink with. And I think you named The Rock, Johnny Depp, and David Beckham. So just wondering the story behind those three selections. Um, well, Johnny Depp's my favourite actor of all time. I just really enjoy his films and. I just really like Johnny Depp. Um, What's your favourite film of his? Um, I I really like Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, I, I like I like Pirates as well. I, I think it's a good bit of acting from him. I really like P- Public Enemy, where he plays the get the uh, gangster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like Half Mass, where he plays the retired gangster. I like I like all of his films. I think he's a superb actor, and I think just really like his films. And um, then uh, the Rock and David Beckham. Uh, the The Rock, I I really like wrestling, and I think the Rock The Rock's been one of the probably the best wrestler over the last maybe twenty or so years, and. I think he's a really he seems a really nice person. He comes across really well, and I just think it would be, think he's really nice to have a dinner with him. I think it would be a de- definitely a very interesting drink um, with with him, wouldn't it? You you definitely hear a lot of stories, and yeah, he, he does. He comes across as a great guy, doesn't he? In a lot of what he does. And then uh, and then you got David Beckham as a Welsh football fan. You picked David Beckham. Uh, yeah, I think he's probably, you know he's English, he's probably one of my my favourite players growing up. I always look back um, and um, just think it would be really nice to to um, to learn about his motivation and, and uh, training methods and yeah. stuff. And he owns a club now, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be again. I, I'd imagine you get a lot of interesting chats with all three of them. And the last one I, I picked up on, um, 
well, two things actually. Your hobbies. So we obviously discussed Swansea. We've just talked about Johnny Depp and his movies. Um, she like walking your dog Teddy, and also a bit of a bit of a gamer. Is it playing on PlayStation? Yeah, I really enjoy FIFA. Like all football fans yeah. do. So I've just got. Lot- I just got PS5 now with FIFA on, so I've started playing it again this week. <laughs> wow! Yeah, yeah. I'm always on FIFA and trying to trying to do as well as I can with Swansea and and imagining it if it was real life. Yeah, just to take them back to the Premier League. Yeah. <laughs> well, good luck. Hopefully, we get there. Get the, get the big trophy this time. Get some uh, European glory as well while you're at it. Hopefully, I've done my best. <laughs> and finally, then, sorry, this was the last one. The superstition, apparently, that you have. Is it true that you never shave during a competition? No, I have a, I shave the, the first night before the actual competition starts, and then, then I won't shave at all. So, so I, if um, the longer the competition goes on, the, the more um more homeless I look really. <laughs> Sorry, I do exactly the same, but not not because of competition. It's just because there's no reason really, and then it gets annoying and I shave it off. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I do I do fully understand. <laughs> okay, so um, what's the reason behind that? Actually, out of curiosity, is there like obviously for superstition? You think that it's bad luck? Yeah, really. I think it's. I think it's just um I just like to not like to mess around too much like during a competition or stuff with that which is hassle and then I yeah. come back to my room and just relax and I don't want to be messing around trying to shave and stuff. Keep yourself focused on, on what's important. Yeah, really. Um yeah, so 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 that's it really. Fair enough. That makes makes total sense. Um, okay, then before we end the podcast, we've discussed Swans, we discussed your career, we discussed Wales. Anything else that I haven't touched on that you would like to have have a bit of a chat about? Um, yeah, I've got. I really, really love dogs. I mean, dogs are my favorite thing, and I've got a little cockapoo called Ted, Teddy and spend a lot of time with him when I'm not training and walking him and just just a big dog fan, especially of my own dog, Ted, who's a cockapoo. That's, uh, that's lovely to hear. Um, I don't have a dog at home, but my parents have one, Jack Russell, called Frank, and he is an absolute nutter. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've, I've got dogs in the family too, but they're, they're, they're amazing and they do go out for walks and... Um, playing catch and stuff like that yeah always always out get home from training and then i'll take take ted out then on on weekends always try and take him somewhere nice like down a local beach try and burn off some of that energy and it, it's always a really nice day if i'm out with ted and i think because it, it relaxed me yeah well i think when you're in such a competitive environment all the time that sort of distraction out in the natural environment, I guess, is really important to have that sort of escape. Yeah, definitely. I think if you can take your mind off it, I think it's always a big bonus if you can take your mind and relax your mind. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, you're from Swansea. I mean, there's a lot of places in the UK probably far worse for getting out and about and exploring the natural environment than, than down here. We're quite lucky with the Gower, the beaches, you know, the Brecon Beacon's not too far away. So where's your kind of favourite places to go and explore with Eddie? Um, love, love all the Gower. Port Island's really nice. It's a really good walk. And then up the hills and back down. Um, Carswell's really nice. Um, Rosselli's. Lots of different places, but normally just taking down Swansea Bay, I find that really nice because it's not too far and then it's just an easier walk. Then, yeah, so that's my normal place is Swansea Bay, but I take him all over really. And I'm sure, I'm sure he loves going on a walk as well. I'm sure, he loves to get out. <laughs> yeah, he loves- well. 
it's been it's been a really nice chatting with you, Paul. I really appreciate you joining. Um, and you're free to come back anytime. Maybe after your next big win, we'll get you back on and you can tell us all about it. Or after maybe if the Swans manage to go up to the Premier League, you can uh, come and celebrate with us. Um, okay. Or maybe maybe Lee will be with me next time as well then. But thank you very much for coming on. If anybody wants to know more, see more about Paul, you are on Twitter, aren't you? So they yeah. can perhaps... Um, catch up with you there if you want to tell us what your handle is um twitter's paul underscore carabadek and then um at okay um but yeah um i'll catch up I'll, I'll end the podcast and say i'll catch up with you say a proper goodbye but thank you very much once again it's been really um insightful actually discussing your journey um i think it's one of those things you don't quite appreciate but when you hear people speak about the stuff they go through like it is definitely eye-opening and I appreciate coming on and sharing that with us and congratulations on your recent World Cup success as well and enjoy having that label as being a world champion and one of the few world champions from Swansea as well you are definitely going to have that forever so be proud of it and well done and keep putting the effort in as well we want to make the singles next time we want to hear about the singles so hopefully you can share that with us next time um but yeah go give paul a follow on twitter go wish him congratulations and good luck for future endeavors for france paralympics and uh, we shall catch you on the next podcast thanks for listening as always and we shall see you next time